Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> this could be in the form of raw uh, photon arrivals. So I have to, there's a thing that popped up here. Okay, let me just, whoops. Sorry, I guess I can't get the, uh, there was a permission for recording that popped up and I couldn't get rid of it. Um, so we start off with raw data, process it through our um, formalism, which I'll be talking to you about a little bit today, Bayesian nonparametrics in particular, and ultimately arrive at a, um, at a detailed picture, oftentimes of the many body physics, which is responsible for life as we know it. So as I walk you to this journey of what it is we do, I'd like to start off with um, a quote from one of the very first textbooks or the very first textbook ever written on probability by Laplace himself, who said that I will present to you in this introduction the principle of the calculus of probabilities and applying them to questions of the greatest importance to life, which are in effect for the most part, but questions of probability. The means to arrive at the truth is grounded in probability in such a way that the entire system of knowledge relates back to the theory exposed herein. There is great advantage in following its principles and there are even deeper inconveniences and in straying away from it. I only desire for the re reflections put forward in this introduction to merit the attention of philosophers, which I guess today we would call natural scientists, and direct them towards an object worthy of their investigation. And what Laplace basically put forward in the paragraph that I'm now going to blur out is the foundations of Bayesian knowledge, uh, Bayesian logic uh, towards inference. We'll sort of talk a little bit briefly about Bayesian logic. We will extend it to Bayesian nonparametrics. Um, and ultimately, I'll show you how it applies uh, to single spot confocal and how you can extract sort of single molecule reaction diffusion from single photons, ideally with as few as 5,000 photons. So one basic question one could ask is, what is the stoichiometry of a particular cluster at a location? Now, following Laplace's logic uh, from the paragraph uh, sort of faded out, what we would basically do is to start off by saying that any stoichiometry is possible. This is normally what people call priors in Bayesian logic or in Bayesian within the Bayesian framework. But ultimately, as we start increasing the number of photons uh, that reach our detector, we start acquiring a more and more increasingly precise estimation for what the stoichiometry of the cluster ultimately is, hopefully leading us to a very sharp sort of delta function uh, expectation grounded or centered around the correct value. So the idea behind all Bayesian methods is ultimately to start off with a guess and arrive at an improved guess. Our guess, as I've already mentioned, is sometimes called the prior or the prior distribution. That's prior to the data. An improved guess is sometimes called a posterior. That's after uh, the data, post being after. Even when Laplace put forward this logic, what he had in mind was astronomical data where you can go ahead and observe and infer the cause, but it's very difficult with, as it pertains to astronomical data to go ahead and simulate, especially in Laplace's time. So I would say sort of the entirety of the physics and physical chemistry paradigm have sort of been dominated by the notion following Laplace of starting off with theory and forward simulating uh, the data and then comparing predictions to that observed in the data. But Laplace, and skip forward, you know, um, a couple cent you know, one or two centuries, um, actually proposed the inverse strategy. That is, you start off with the data and try to infer the cause. Again, this was relevant to astronomy. And frankly, this is uh, what we oftentimes have to do in biophysics today. So the idea is to start off oftentimes with the data and to infer parameters of a model. That's what others do. Here's why what we do is a little bit different, and I'll get into the details of that. For the same amount of data, we'd like to be able to infer models as well as their associated parameters. So on the left-hand side, um, you have methods such as maximum likelihood, normal, in other words, parametric Bayesian methods, information theory, and so forth. On the right-hand side, what you have is sort of the domain of Bayesian nonparametrics, a rigorous and logical extension, uh, principled extension of parametric Bayesian methods. Determining models is absolutely critical to us in single molecule. 
I would even argue that the fundamental challenge of all of single molecule biophysics is the model selection problem. And I give you examples of a model selection problem here. On the left-hand side, uh, painted sort of in, in a red line with a red contour, is sort of the contour of a fictitious pseudo E. coli. And we're asking the question, within this exposure, this, within the single camera exposure, is it one biomolecule moving? Is it two? Is it three, right? In the middle, how many um, biomolecular actors are contained within that individual fluorescent spot? And on the right-hand side, how many states are visited, for example, in this trace? Could be for spectroscopy, could be a Fred efficiency trace, it could be an ion patch clamp experiment. Those are all fundamentally model selection problems. Now this slide is complicated, but I think it does drive home a point that so far we have sought experimental solutions to model selection in order to be able to address some of the questions on the previous slide. Uh, but naturally, these come with compromises. In fact, the 2014 Chemistry Nobel Prize was awarded for what I would consider to be a solution to a very specific case of the model selection problem, which is can we resolve and count the number of molecules below light's diffraction limit? That's the very topmost uh, solution. Unfortunately, along with that comes the, um, the elimination of almost all temporal resolution. Uh, and we can talk about various methods like these in detail. So as theorists, maybe we can contribute. Um, I would argue that we need a better theory, a better way to look at the data. And fundamentally, we need new mathematics. And the goal is really to learn models uh, from the data. So there was an idea proposed by this fellow, Thomas Ferguson, in 1973. At that time, the paper was sort of an intellectual curiosity until, of course, uh, computational tools became available in order to put many of these ideas to the test. And the basic idea is essentially to start off with a prior, not only over parameters, but priors over models themselves. In other words, whenever we assume sort of uniform priors in the way that I showed earlier, such as when we're trying to determine the stoichiometry of a spot, we always had sort of in mind a particular uh, model. But the idea here is rather than to use a delta function prior on model, why not assume that models themselves are random variables? Right? So the idea ultimately is to learn uh, both parameters and associated models simultaneously and self-consistently. So that's the basis behind uh, Bayesian nonparametrics. So now I'd like to show you an example of where it applies. So some of you might be familiar with this. Some of you might be familiar with this much more than I am. Uh, but um, if you'll indulge me and let a, um, a theorist describe to you what single spot confocal is for a minute, um, I think it'll be helpful towards understanding an, an important application of Bayesian nonparametrics. So here's an example of a single spot confocal. You have light coming from your um, objective lens and you ultimately detect the light at one particular, uh, one particular location. So if we look at sort of the overlap between the uh, emission, what people call the emission point spread function and the detection point spread function, you're really only looking at particles within a small sort of elliptical confocal volume sort of shown by that red, uh, red circle. The idea here is that since you have a single photon detector, what you detect are single photon arrivals as labeled molecules emit photons as they enter this excitation volume. Right? So the excitation volume itself is not homogeneous. It's a little bit uh, dimmer at the edges and brighter in the middle. So the basic idea is that you might, you know, if we're looking at this now top down, you might, if you have a molecule traversing this confocal, you might have one molecule. And eventually that molecule may start meandering away from the confocal as another one enters and so on and so forth. So in time, what my single photon detector collects are photon arrivals versus time. And presumably the number of photon arrivals correlate with the number of molecules within the spot at that moment in time. They also correlate with where the molecule is located with respect to the center of that spot. Because remember the center of the spot is the brightest location. And the goal, going back to sort of Laplace's picture, of uh, starting off with data and inferring the cause is to learn the diffusion coefficients and possibly even reaction rates of molecules 
as they react, as they traverse through that volume. The idea, therefore, um, is to collect, now traditionally, I should say, the idea behind this method is to collect data for a very long time, um, oftentimes over the course of minutes. Whoops. To autocorrelate the photon arrivals and to arrive at this correlation function here. So what does the correlation function tell us? Very briefly, you can think about it this way. If a molecule is diffusing slowly uh, through a confocal spot, um, the photon arrivals should be very correlated with themselves. And this uh, photon intensity correlation function should decay very slowly. So intuitively, you can sort of guess that the rate of decay of this correlation function is tightly tied to the diffusion coefficient of the molecule as it traverses through the spot. There's advantages to what's called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So in other words, this correlative analysis of single spot data um, correlation functions are extremely fast to calculate and they provide immediate intuition. Um, but there are severe advantages. Um, it only, you only get nice analytic forms for these correlation functions if your confocal spot has a very specific geometry. And in particular, if you try to do this in vivo and you have refractive index mismatches, uh, you can run into aberrated geometries, which is something you need to worry about. Um, it requires a steady state process, why? because you're collecting data over minutes and minutes and minutes and autocorrelating it. Um, therefore, it requires long data traces and therefore it can be phototoxic. I would say the most important of all is that it is fundamentally a bulk method. It is not a single molecule method. So I can tell you sort of an average diffusion coefficient of all the molecules that traversed the volume, but I certainly can tell you what the diffusion coefficient of that molecule that gave rise to a photon burst was. And that is an important limitation. So, now I'm gonna tell you how uh, Bayesian on parametrics tackles the problem. Again, when I compare advantages or disadvantages, that's like comparing um, sort of a Stokes-Einstein approximation to computational Navier-Stokes, right? Um, it isn't because we have computational Navier-Stokes that suddenly back of the envelope, Stokes-Einstein goes away. Back of the envelope, Stokes-Einstein will always be there. It'll always be the most efficient, but some problems do require computational Navier-Stokes. So we don't want to do this. In fact, what we want is single molecule resolution. Question is, why haven't people done this historically? FCS has been around since the 70s. Um, we have, we've had plenty of time to think about this. So why haven't we done it? Um, well, fundamentally, we haven't had the mathematics or the mathematical tools to do it. New problems require new mathematics. And some of the mathematics we use here are scarcely a decade old. I should say that half my postdocs in my lab, at least historically, have been mathematicians. So let's talk about it. If I assume, for example, in this time trace, that I have one particle that gave rise to these photons, then I assume a certain, or then I compute a certain posterior probability for the diffusion coefficient, kind of centered somewhere around five microns squared per second. If I happen to guess the correct value, which here is denoted by the red dotted line, then it so happens that my posterior is centered around exactly the correct value. But I would have had to guess how many molecules are responsible for this signal. And that is a model selection problem. So sort of in a PRX in 2020 and in Nature Communications in 2019, and a subsequent paper that I'll be talking to you about um, shortly in terms of future directions, we tried to address this problem. We tried to learn basically everything that FCS does, but perhaps with two orders, sometimes with three orders of magnitude, less data from a couple thousand photons. And now we're going to eventually extend it to dynamics. So in order to take single spot confocal correlative analysis, FCS, so the single molecule level, we really need to start from scratch. So what we need to do is to think about the raw data as it arrives. These are typically single photon delta T arrivals. Now, if you imagine, Perhaps we have some kind of pulsed excitation. It's not necessary, it could be continuous, but if we have some pulsed excitation, then we have sort of the little, little t's as people call them, or the lifetimes that we record at our detector. Uh, and the goal is ultimately to learn diffusion coefficients and ideally trajectories which dictate the distance of the molecule from the center of the confocal. Now, in order to probabilistically relate the output 
to the things that we care about, namely the diffusion coefficients and the trajectories, we need to sort of hierarchically link um, the input, which is the data, to the thing that we want. So we start off by saying that the delta Ts, of course, are induced by photons and potentially dark detector noise. And so we need sort of a, a detailed detector model. Subsequently, the photons themselves can come from the background or the biomolecule. Um, the biomolecule could also have complex photophysics to worry about. So we need to embed that sort of in the problem. So right off the bat, you can recognize that this inference problem has both a discrete component to it because the molecule could be switching discreetly between different photophysical states, but also a continuous component to it because the molecule is continuously exploring a region of illumination as it diffuses in real space. Um, and finally, the molecule, as I said, diffuses in real space and therefore a diffusion coefficient links the positions um, at various time points. The real killer is that I don't know currently using existing mathematics, how many molecules are responsible for the photons that I observe. So that was sort of graphically. And now if you don't mind me indulging me for just one slide, I will actually show you in mathematics what it is we do. This is what's normally called a forward model. Um, in other words, we describe the entire process and then we will be computing the inverse model. I won't show you how we do that, but at least at the very least I can show you the details of the forward model. So we basically say that the delta T, the time between photons can be exponentially distributed. That would be in the case of continuous illumination. The rate of photon emission is some mu and the rate of photon emission is the sum of background emission and the emission for every single one of our existing emitters. Now, the emitters will emit in a way which is related to their position within the point spread function. In other words, their actual x, y, z location, where k here indicates the kth photon or the kth time step or kth detection, and n superscript indicates the molecule itself. There's a very important variable that I introduced here, and this is where the Bayesian nonparametrics parametrics come in. Remember, I don't know, and this is why since the 70s, people have been autocorrelating the signal. I don't know how many molecules are at the center of the confocal. So therefore, what I'm gonna to have to do is to introduce an infinite number of molecules, basically put a prior on an infinite number of them. And eventually what I'm going to do is to allow some of them to flicker into existence. So I put a beta, uh, a beta, a Bernoulli random variable B, which can be one or zero. Um, preceding every molecule. So molecules can either exist or not exist. And then I put priors on those infinite collection of Bs. Finally, we allow the molecule to diffuse in physical space according to sort of, in this case, diffusion in, um, in open space with some diffusion coefficients. I won't get into the details, but we have to place priors that we can discuss. And finally, this is so the so-called um, non-parametric addition. We add a beta Bernoulli process prior on this indicator variable, the B, that allows us, as I said, to flicker these molecules into existence. Now, that was sort of a slightly simplified forward model um, with no photophysics or no camera artifacts, but you sort of get an idea for how it is we propose these models. And ultimately the goal is to arrive at a, you know, by, by multiplying the likelihood, which is dictated by the equations that I have here and the prior, I arrive at a posterior. And then 99.9% .9 of our effort is devoted in how to go about sampling this posterior. In other words, to determine the quantities we care about. So very briefly, as you can see with more or less 500 photons, we can get the results um, that it would take substantially more uh, photons uh, for, the, um, uh, for FCS uh, to converge. And if I look at, and of course we've run a bunch of controls in our papers, which are not particularly interesting. But if we look at what the correlation functions look like at 500 or 1500 photons, it's, basic, it's basically still a gunshot plot. Um, I really do need to reach um, quite a few more photons, something on the order of you know, one times 10 to the five in order to reach any reasonable correlation function. And the available code is here. Well, the question now is, what do we do with all the rest of the data, the 99.9% .9 of the data? And sort of in the four and a half minutes that I have left, what I'm going to tell you about is a collaboration we have going on with Ben Schuler. So we imagine two IDP, intrinsically disordered protein fragments, uh, one of which is very negatively charged, prothymazine, it's a transcription factor, and the other one is a linker histone that interacts with uh, DNA. The prothymazine itself is labeled with a FRET 
So first a resonance energy transfer um, donor and acceptor. And as these two interact, the prothymazine compactifies and we get FRET efficiency uh, and we get FRET transfer. So we detect uh, different color photons. So for example, this could be our input data. And from that input data alone, sort of on the order of you know, a few thousand photons, we'd like to be able to infer chemical trajectories, in other words, the binding and binding, um, as well as locations of the molecule with respect to the center of the confocal. In other words, genuine, honest to goodness, single molecule, single photon reaction diffusion. Um, this is what happens when you do it with, uh, with real data. Problem is here, we don't have ground truth. Um, so let me tell you some sort of results that we obtained. We have three cases here, one of which we have 75 picomolar labeled prothymazine, and for all intents and purposes, a small amount of unlabeled um, histone and P. And you know, we get some diffusion coefficient, some FRED efficiency, and some escape rate for about 5,000 photons. Um, those are sort of consistent with what um, you get in the literature with orders of magnitude more photons. We more or less look at, we can look at as low as one burst, but typically we look at as many as five bursts at once. But here's a little bit more interesting. As we increase dramatically the amount of unlabeled H, so that's the H we cannot see, what do we encounter? Well, of course, our diffusion coefficient drops, right? Because now we are forming a cluster, we are forming a reaction. The FRED efficiency increases exactly as we'd expect if prothymazine is sort of compactifying uh, around the histone. And finally, the escape rate decreases essentially for all intents and purposes to zero because the H and P are now very strongly interacting and we are never seeing them unbind, which is sort of consistent with the literature that says that the unbinding rates are on the order of inverse minutes, something we would just never observe if we analyze individual bursts. And we can go up to even higher H concentrations where at this point we form large or what's hypothesized to be large P and H clusters. And what we find is roughly the same FRED efficiency, which is exactly what you would expect if a P is interacting with a large H and P uh, sort of cluster, um, diffusion coefficients, which are dramatically reduced, and escape rates, which are actually a little bit higher, because now you're slightly more loosely bound, consistent with what the literature has been reporting. So in summary, Bayesian nonparametrics are a powerful logical extension of traditional Bayesian methods. They were proposed in 73, though Many of the tools we use, honestly, are less than half a decade old. We can now probe rapid non-equilibrium single molecule processes, sort of at the temporal resolution of data acquisition. The goal is ultimately to catch chemical reactions on the fly um, at the single molecule, single photon level. And we're ultimately thinking of even increased generalizations of the methods we're talking about here, and particularly even trying to deal with sort of aberrated spots as we try to do this in vivo. So the question is, can we redo it all? Um, I hope so. Um, I have either a postdoc or a graduate student working on each one of sort of the major existing methods in order to be able to redo the analysis of spectroscopic and wide field methods, um, sort of one at a time, properly reformulated uh, with non-parametrics. You know, von Neumann said, if people do not believe that mathematics is simple, it is only because they do not realize how complicated life is. Keep an eye open for this. Um, you know, I think I'm paying myself 25 cents an hour to do this. <laughs> the first data analysis textbook um, for the natural sciences. Um, we will be discussing hidden Markov models, um, other kinds of Markov models, computational statistics, and ultimately, you know, Gaussian processes and Bayesian nonparametrics. So if you want to keep your eyes open for it, um, it sh we, we are under contract with Cambridge University Press. Thank you to my many organizers. Um, to my very many lab members. This was a lot of work by Sina Jazani, who's now postdoc in Take Chip Haas lab, as well as Mesam Tarakoli, who's now uh, a medical resident, and Zelia Kilic, um, research scientist at St. Jude's, and Wei Ching Shu, who's, a, um, um, who's still a graduate student in the lab. And the experiments here are from Ben Schuler and Daniel Nettles' lab. Um, you know, thank you. Please add us on Twitter. Uh, this is where we post all of our latest um, updates uh, for the lab. And in particular, I'm trying to make it a mental point to post all of our uh, preprints um, to Twitter as soon as we post them. So please follow us there to have our latest lab updates. And if you remember nothing else uh, from what I've told you,
well, sure, you can scan me too. That's not what I was going to say. <laughs> this is for a lab website. But if you really remember nothing else, remember that uh, we are hiring. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, shoot me an email. Uh, we are a fun crowd of people. And um, hopefully, you know, it'll, um, it'll work out. So thank you all. Thank you, Steve, for the wonderful talk. So I will ask you some of the questions that are from the chat, and then we can take more. Sure. So Jinwa asked a question that you might have answered partially, but still I would ask it. Uh, in your analysis, do you need to, uh, you know, do you need to think of potential complexity due to interactions between molecules, for example, complex formation? Yes, so in fact, that is, um, I guess that's where we got, maybe this question was asked towards the beginning of the talk. So I guess eventually this is where we, um, this yeah. is what I discussed towards the second half uh, of the yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jing Chen is asking, what is the space of models explored in this non-parametric? Do you have to constrain to a specific group of models? Yeah, that's a great question. So non-parametrics actually applies to uh, nested model structures. So basically, for example, you have to choose what you want to be non-parametric about, and everything else is parametric. So for example, I can choose to be non-parametric, and you can also choose to be non-parametric about any number of things as well. So you can be doubly non-parametric. It has never been done, but we're actually doing it right now in the lab for two different problems. So it is possible to be doubly non-parametric in terms of two things. One thing that we're considering right now is different kinds of diffusion models, as well as different number of molecules, or you can be non-parametric about the shape of the confocal and other properties. Um, so you can choose, pick and choose what you want to be non-parametric about. And within that, um, you have to pick what's called nested models. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I guess at this point, I will ask the audience, I will invite the audience to, you know, you can unmute yourselves. You can raise your hands or you can ask questions directly, however you would like to do it. And I guess I will uh, stop recording at this stage.